talking about the covenant of grace. During Lent, we're moving toward a fuller appreciation of what Jesus called the new covenant written in my blood, which is poured out for you. In the last two weeks, we've read about God's covenant with Noah and all flesh and God's covenant with Abraham and the nations he fathered. The covenant that God made with Abraham was renewed with his son Isaac and later to Isaac's son Jacob. God confirmed the covenant to him at Bethel. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants, and your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. And by you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. Jacob would not have known that he would be going to Egypt and that for 400 years his descendants would be slaves, that the promise would lie dormant until God confirmed it afresh with Moses. But God's ways are seldom our ways, and it was indeed God's plan to carry his covenant people through the miseries of Egypt to the promised land. That divine principle has not changed to this day. Paul tells us in Romans 8, if we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. After a long, dark night of Israel's soul, dawn breaks. God calls Moses, and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God liberates his people from bondage. They cross the Red Sea on dry ground. They receive food from the sky and water from the rock. And three months later, they arrive at Mount Sinai, where God makes a solemn covenant with Israel to confirm and undergird the covenant he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Exodus 19 through 34 is concerned with the making of this covenant. And in these chapters, we can see how the covenant was established, what divine promises and human conditions make up the covenant, and how it leads to God's plan for the work of Jesus Christ. When Moses goes up to Mount Sinai for the first time, God tells him the general terms of the covenant. If you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my special possession a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Moses goes down and reports to the people and they accept the covenant saying, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses conveys that acceptance to the Lord and the Lord announces he's coming down to speak directly to the people so that they can believe Moses. God instructs Moses to consecrate the people to prepare them to receive him and what he has to say. In three days, they are to approach the mountain. In three days, the Lord descends in fire, the mountain wrapped in smoke. Then God himself addresses the people and gives them the Ten Commandments. The people are so terrified at the thundering voice of God that they plead with Moses, you speak to us and we will hear, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. So Moses draws near to receive the rest of the ordinances from the Lord. These are given in chapters 21 through 23 and include a lot more specifics than the Ten Commandments we know, the ones we just read the ones you probably memorized when you were a child. God tells Moses to bring the priest and elders up on the mountain, but first Moses reports all the ordinances to the people, and again, they accept the terms of the covenant. All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Then Moses writes the words in a book, builds an altar, sacrifices several oxen, and seals the covenant with blood. He throws some blood on the altar, reads the book aloud to the people, and sprinkles the people with blood. The implication is probably that the people are swearing that if they break this covenant, their blood will be shed like the oxen's, and their guilt will be on their own heads. Moses leads Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders halfway up the mountain where they feast together and witness God's glory. 
Next, the Lord caused Moses further up to receive the tables of stone written by God himself. Moses goes up into the cloud. The elders wait and worry and wonder while he is gone. Chapters 25 through 31 give the message God spoke to Moses, mainly a plan for a tabernacle to be built and the ministry of the priest who will serve there. When he was done, God gave Moses two tablets to take to the people. It was like a hand-signed covenant from the Lord. Moses does not know it, but during the 40 days he was gone, the people had already broken their covenant promise, made an idol, and worshipped it. God says, they have turned quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Because Moses intercedes for the people, God withholds his destruction. When Moses comes down to the camp and witnesses the deplorable behavior of his people, he is beyond angry. He smashes the two tables of the covenant to show just how the people have broken their covenant with God. Consequently, the sons of Levi slaughter 3,000 men and God sends a plague. But the nation as a whole is spared through Moses' intercession. Now the question becomes, what happens to that covenant? They had broken it before it was even completed. If the covenant were based on works or strict justice alone, Israel would have been done for. But to show that the covenant is based on grace, God renews the covenant and makes this gracious foundation clear. God tells Moses to make a new set of stone tablets and to come up again to see him. Then God reveals himself and the basis of the renewed covenant. God passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation? Moses pleads, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. And the Lord responds, behold, I make a covenant. Before all your people, I will do marvels such have not been wrought in all the earth or in any nation. Then in Genesis 34, 27 and 28, the Lord concludes this last meeting on Mount Sinai. And the Lord said to Moses, in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And he came down with his face shining because of his time with God. Notice the promises in the covenant established between God and Israel. There seem to be at least five of them. First, Israel will be God's prized possession. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among the people, for all the earth is mine. God mentions that all the earth is his to show that when he calls Israel his own possession, he more means to give them more than just the general care and authority he shares with the rest of the world. He will be Israel's God, and they will be his in a special way. They will have distinctive blessings beyond the other nations. They will be gods if they keep the covenant. The second promise is, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. The privilege of the priests was to be intimate, to have access to God. They drew near on behalf of the people. Their inheritance was not the land, but the Lord. God promises this privilege to the whole nation. It is heightened when God calls them a royal priesthood, in service to the king. There is no greater privilege than to have intimate access to the king of the universe. The third promise of the covenant is that Israel will also be a holy nation. 
Israel would be holy in two senses. She would be set apart and distinguished from all the other peoples. And she would be granted to develop a moral likeness to God. She would share in God's character. Be holy, for I am holy. She will be his holy nation. The fourth covenant promise is found in Exodus 23. If you hearken attentively to his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Anybody who opposes Israel will have to deal with the Almighty Lord if Israel keeps covenant. This is probably what God means when he promises, I will do marvels such as have not been wrought in all of the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. In defense of his people, God will display his power and glory among the nations. Finally, and as a foundation to everything else, God promises to be merciful and gracious to forgive iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34 offers the sweetest gospel words in the Old Testament. The fact that they come from Mount Sinai and not Mount Calvary, the fact that they preface the Ten Commandments and not the Book of Romans, shows that the message of Christ and the message of Moses are one harmonious message of grace. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So the fifth great promise of the Mosaic Covenant is that God will treat Israel with mercy and grace and forgive her sins if she keeps the covenant. These divine promises of the covenant all depend on certain conditions being fulfilled by the people. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall experience all these divine blessings. So we now turn to the human conditions that must be met in order to enjoy the covenant blessings. First, we have to remember the covenant is founded on grace and forgiveness. It's not owed to us. We don't just inherit it from our parents. It says the Lord forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, that the foundation of the covenant is grace. Israel must obey God's voice and keep God's covenant. It does not mean they earn their blessings by working for God. It means they must keep themselves in a relationship where they can continue to receive God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. Amid the Ten Commandments, we find, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love or mercy to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Israel upholds her side of the covenant by loving God and not putting any other value where God belongs in her heart. From this love of God, inevitably, flows an obedience to his word. God is not loved when we act like he is an employer and we're his employees. It's unthinkable that the command to love God would be to command and earn blessings from him. On the contrary, the command to love God, a God who is gracious and forgiving, must include the obligation to trust him. The only way to receive forgiveness is by trusting the forgiver. And the only way to benefit from gracious promises is to trust the promise giver. The fundamental condition that Israel had to meet to enjoy God's blessing was trust, faithfulness, steadfast love, the kind God offered to her. Again and again in the Old Testament, the rebellion of Israel against the covenant is traced back to unbelief. Psalm 78 looks back and says that God's anger flamed against Israel in the wilderness because they had no faith in God and did not trust his saving power. Or as Hebrews 4 says, the message which they heard did not benefit them because it did not meet with faith 
in the hearers. There are at least three reasons to conclude that the basic condition required from Israel is faith. It's the same obedience required in the Abrahamic covenant when the Lord said to Abraham, by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It's the same obedience required in the new covenant under which we live. Hebrews 5 says of Christ that being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the covenant that Jesus sealed with his own blood are all various expressions of one great covenant of grace. And under all these covenants expressed in many ways, one thing is required for man to inherit covenant blessings. It is faith working through love, just as Paul wrote to the Galatians. Isaiah saw it most clearly when he said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How could a just God under a Mosaic law be gracious and forgive so freely? Apparently, God looked forward to the coming of his son and the sacrifice that repairs all injury done to God's honor through the disobedience of God's people. There could have been no covenant with Abraham, no covenant with Moses, no new covenant without the coming of Jesus Christ. What was freely given under Moses was purchased by Christ. If you want a fresh glimpse of Jesus this Lenten season to help you trust him and love him and obey him, consider these two things. First, the crushing weight of every forgiven sin from Adam to the end of the age was laid on the innocent Christ. He accepted it willingly for the glory of his father and the good of his people. Second, if you trust him and follow him in the obedience of faith, then you are heirs, not only of God's covenant with Noah and Abraham, but God's covenant through Moses as well. You are God's special possession. You are a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. God opposes your enemies with wonder-working power. And to you, he is now and always will be the Lord, the Lord, God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Oh, that we might love Jesus with a new heartfelt affection in this season. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived are the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Thanks be to God for the covenant of his grace. Let's pray. Almighty God, fill us with your spirit. Fill our minds with your word. Fill our hearts with your love and make of us the holy nation you have called us to be through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.